Good morning. This is Pastor Randy Richardson with the Bible Heritage Pentecostal Holiness Church in Waycross, Georgia. We're going to start off singing a song that says, This joy that I have, the world did not give it to me. Hallelujah. This joy that I have. Oh, 
experience I have and that's this experience you need to have where the peace of God that passes all understanding fills your heart and mind. It's not based off your circumstances. It's based off of your relationship with Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. I have found His grace is all complete. He supplies
Praise God. Praise God. Nice trip there. <laughs> Praise the Lord. If you have your Bibles, turn to the book of Galatians, chapter 5, and verse number 20. Galatians, chapter 5, and verse 20. Today is Father's Day, and we recognize all of you fathers who are watching us by way of internet today. We thank God for the role of a father in our lives. Praise God. Galatians 5, beginning in verse 19. Now the works of the flesh are evident. In other words, everybody can see it. Everybody knows it. It's no secret. It's evident. Which are adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lewdness, idolatry, sorcery, hatred, contentions, jealousies, outbursts of wrath, selfish ambitions, dissensions, and heresies. I want us to look uh, this morning at four of these uh, heated emotions. In fact, that's what I've titled this message, Heated Emotions. The first one is hatred or enmity. There are many kinds of hatred. I hate baked beans. I don't like them. I don't like to eat them. I, I go to a Mexican restaurant and they have those refried beans. I do not like refried beans. I can honestly say I hate refried beans. Okay? Now, it's no sin to hate food products. <laughs> some people hate spinach. Some people hate liver. You know, on and on. Well, when we have hatred, feelings of hatred towards God, you say, oh, but people hate God. Yes, people hate God. When they don't get their way, when mama don't get healed, when their wife don't get healed, when their husband don't get healed, when their child dies, a lot of people hold unforgiveness towards God. And they begin to hate God because he allowed something tragic to happen in their life or something to happen to one of their loved ones. And so there's a buildup of hatred. And uh, God is love. And everything about God is the opposite of hatred. When we don't get our way, when we feel hurt, upset, with this emotion left on its own, it just builds and builds and builds, and then bitterness comes, and and unforgiveness comes and all types of things are attached to this emotion of hatred. Left unchallenged, all of its brothers will come, even possibly murder. I'm here to tell you, you cannot leave hatred in your heart. Now, I, I listed off adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lewdness, all these things. Most Christians don't have a problem with those things. Where Christians struggle is in the four areas that I'm going to talk about this morning. And there's a lot of people sitting in a pew in a church this morning, listening by way of internet, that are filled with hatred towards another human being for what they did. That's why God told us to go to our brother who's offended us in Matthew 18 and said, if you have fault between you and your brother, make sure you leave the altar and go to them and make things right. Do you know there's been people that have done me so wrong and I had to go to them and I had to say, if I've done anything to offend you, I am so sorry. And that always opened the door for them to say, well, I did thus and so. You see, most of the time, it takes two to tango. <laughs> and sometimes I have just as much fault in, in what's happened to me as, as another. Now, there are exceptions, you know, rape and molestation and things like that. You don't have a, it's none of your fault whatsoever, period. 
But the enemy would love to plant a seed of hatred in your heart. Because when hatred builds, it shoves love out. And it shoves God out of your life. Because God cannot dwell in a hateful temple, a hateful person. Christians must walk in a constant state of forgiveness. Do you know why there's over 300 churches in Waycross? It's because God's people can't get along. It's not even doctrinal differences. We're talking about probably 20 some odd uh, Pentecostal various brand churches. And there's uh, a couple of hundred Baptist churches. And so what does that say? It just says that people have a problem getting along because it's not doctrine. Church of God, Church of God prophecy, Assemblies of God, Pentecostal wholeness, we all believe the same, pretty much the exact same thing. We have different governments. And that's just about all there is different in our churches today. Baptists, same thing. They all pretty much believe the same thing. But they split and went down the road because they got their feelings hurt or somebody said something or they didn't like the preacher or they didn't like this. And, and so they just took their little toys and ran down the road to play somewhere else. And most of the time, churches that are built on splits do not survive. And when they do, they're very ineffective for the kingdom of God. Some people that profess to be Christians are lazy. Let's admit it. There are some people that profess to be Christians that get on your last nerve. There are some people that profess to be Christian that are rude and some are downright mean and hateful. So when you're confronted with that kind of a spirit and that kind of a person, I'm here to tell you, <laughs> it's hard sometimes to love some unlovable people. Some porcupine folks that, that keep their stingers out and every time you go by them they <coughs> shoot you with one of those little porcupine uh, I won't say thorns but it's a needle thing but if you're normal those character traits that I just named are going to bother you we had a man in my last church that was absolutely L-A-Z-Y I mean he was lazy he had about eight or nine kids he weren't too lazy to do that, but every when it came to holding down a job, he was L-A-Z-Y. And he would have no qualms about going to every man in the church and asking them for money so that he could take his wife out to eat or buy her a birthday present or something of that nature. And I'm telling you, it was difficult to love him. And, and I know myself as his pastor, I, I coached him and encouraged him and counseled him to go get a job. And finally, he did go get a job. And I'm so thankful that he finally, after years of being such a lazy man. But you know what? I, I, I have a hard time with lazy people because I'm not lazy. I get up the crack of dawn and I stay up till the crack of dark 30 and, and, and I'm running fast as I can go and when I see people that are just lazy it eats my lunch it, it, it upsets me I don't like it so when I see that it would be so easy for me to start judging that person feeling bad towards that person thinking I'm better than that person all those kinds of emotions lead to hatred to where you get where you see them, you're like, oh my Lord, I despise them. I don't like them. Now, let me just clarify this. You don't have to like everybody. There are some people that you have to avoid. The Bible even says, mark them, which cause division among you, and avoid them. That's scripture. So there are some people you need to avoid. I had a, I had a, a church member one time that he told a, another pastor he said, look, I have forgiven you eight different times for how you've hurt my family. And he said, but you know what? <laughs> I got to stay away from you because you 
I, I, I got to forgive you, and then I got to stay away from you because you constantly offend me, and I just can't be around you. There are some people that you ought to avoid. You ought to not have anything to do with them because if you do, you're going to develop this trait, this emotion, this heated emotion of hatred. My children would often yell at each other and get angry. And that's normal. Kids, kids do that. And they'd even say, I hate you. And boy, when I heard those words, I'd get up wherever I was at and I'd go get in the middle and referee that fight. And I'd say, in this house, you're not allowed to hate anybody. So get in the love jail. And they'd say, what? So I put your arms around. In fact, I do it with Braylon and Brianna when they get to carrying on. I say, all right, it's love jail time. And oh, they hate it because they got to stand facing each other. In fact, I tell them to put cheek to cheek. And then they put their arms around. Boy, you should see them when it first happens. They're, they're, they're stretching their arms as far as they can. And their cheek just is, if they could just be off the cheek just a half a centimeter. But before long, they start laughing and they start smiling. And then they really do hug each other. And I say, all right, I'll give each other a good bear hug. And then they're out of jail. And I would love sometime to put some of God's people in the love jail. Wouldn't that be funny? Call an altar call and say, all right, I want sister so-and-so and sister so-and-so come on up here in the love jail. We used to have foot washing services in different churches that we pastored. And uh, it's a good experience. If you've never been in one, it's, it's a great experience. And uh, But I would love to pick the people that they wash the feet of. Because I hear everything, you know. Whether I want to or not as a pastor, I just hear everything. And, and, and I know when so-and-so don't like this one. And, and, and brother so-and-so don't like this one. And. And, and I would love to say, you know, brother so-and-so, come on over here and wash this one's feet today. See, that's the, the purpose of foot washing anyway, is to make sure you humble yourself and empty yourself of any of these heated emotions. 1 John 4, 8 says, he who does not love does not know God, for God is love. If we hate our brother, our heart is not right with God. And yet it's so prevalent in churches today that people hate. They hate Democrats. They, it, it's like the church has become Republican. And, and I understand. I appreciate the platform of the Republican Party. But I don't hate. I do not hate the Democrats. Now there's some I don't like. There's some I don't trust. There's some Republicans I don't trust. Some independents I don't trust. But I've got to make sure that I don't hate. In fact, 1 John 4, 20 says, If someone says, I love God and hates his brother, he's a liar. For he who does not love his brother whom he has seen, how can he love God whom he has not seen? So how, how can a person be prejudiced and hate Hispanic people? and hate black people, and hate white people, hate Asian people. People today, because of the coronavirus allegedly starting over in, in China, a lot of people are taken out on uh, Chinese Americans and Asian Americans because some folks are so dumb, they don't know that there are many, many types of Asian folks, you know, Japanese, Korean, um, you know, all, all kinds of Asian folks. And they lump everybody in the same thing and, and they're going around attacking these poor, innocent people who were never in a laboratory in the Wuhan Valley or whatever it's called. Be careful that you don't try to cover up your hatred with churchified words. You say, what do you mean? Well, I don't hate him. I don't hate him. You know, and they, they're, they're clear to say, I don't hate him, but, and then they start spitting out hatred. So 
we got to be careful. Now, like I said, God does not expect you to constantly get along with everybody. In fact, in the book of Acts chapter 15, we have the uh, Paul and Barnabas who were a great tag team in the ministry. But Barnabas called John Mark to go along with them. And when he went, went, went with them, he got homesick or something happened and he abandoned ship and had to go back home. And Paul didn't forgive him for it. He judged him and said he should have stayed to the end. He should have, he should have stayed and stuck with us. And so John uh, Barnabas says to Paul, well, let's give him a second chance. We're going on another trip, and I want to take him with us. And Paul's, I'm not taking him with me. You can take him with you, but I ain't taking him with me. And so the apostle Paul, acting in the flesh, the Bible says he chose Silas and departed and then Barnabas took John Mark and they departed another direction. The good news is the gospel was spread twice as much because they weren't all together. And so, but, but the point I'm trying to make is you don't have to be alone. You don't have to get along with everybody. Paul himself had to get on the two ladies in the church at Philippi. In Philippians chapter 4, verse 2, Paul said, I implore you, Odious, and I implore Syntyche to be of the same mind in the Lord. These were two ladies in the Philippian church that were not getting along, and Paul had had it up to here. And so he calls them to himself, and he says, Ladies, I beg you, I implore you to be of the same mind in the Lord. You know, if we're arguing over this and we're arguing over that, we're not winning souls for the kingdom. If I'm focused on the fact that this person, you know, baked my my favorite dish and, 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 and now they're trying to outshine my dish and now there's jealousy over, <laughs> over your baked beans versus their baked beans, and I've seen it all. I've seen it all. You will not always agree with your Christians, brothers and sisters, but never allow that seed of hatred to remain in you. And let's admit it, we have hatred in us and we gotta get it out. You have to concede, you have to learn to concede your will to another. This is the Bible. Romans 12, 10 says, be kindly affection to one another with brotherly love in honor giving preference to one another. That means if, if, if uh, this person would rather sing this song and I don't want to sing that song, I'm going to sing their song because I'm preferring them over my own will and my own wishes. Realize that you don't have to always be right. <laughs> you know, sometimes being right doesn't get you anywhere. Let's just say it's a husband and wife situation. And, uh, you know, you say, well, it, it, it'd be better if you went this direction. And, and they're driving. And they're like, no, I like to go this way. And, you know, but yeah, but it's better to go that way. And then you wind up arguing over something as silly as a 30 second or a one minute time difference in how to get from one location to another. Folks, that's what breeds unforgiveness hatred and bitterness we have to consider the source sometimes there's some people that are just eat up with stupid <laughs> that's just the truth they're eat up with stupid and they're always going to act stupid and when you know somebody's that way you just have to consider the source and walk in forgiveness towards that person maybe God put that person in your life to rub you the wrong way just to develop the fruit of the Spirit in your life. And then lastly with that, just let it go. Let it go. Let it go. It's time to let hatred go. The second heat and emotion in the scripture there that I read in our text was variance or strife. The spirit of competition, rivalry, contention, discord, quarreling, and fighting, debating for the sake of debating. 
God's people have no business starting arguments. God's people have no business getting into arguments with folks. Do you know how many times people say stuff to me that I just have to let go in one ear and out the other? If I stopped and corrected every single person, I'd, I'd never get anything done. Because sometimes you just have to let it go. There's some people that are going to believe what they believe and they're not going to change. And you cannot force people to believe the way you do. You can teach them. You can show them the word. You can give them the scriptures. And it's up to God, the Holy Ghost, and them. I am never supposed to twist anybody's arm to believe what I believe. You say, Pastor, I don't start arguments, but I sure finish them. <laughs> oh, hallelujah. We don't have to do that, folks. We can be slow to speak, swift to hear, and slow to anger. That's Bible. That's Scripture. Slow to speak, swift to hear, slow to anger. When we see someone else achieving and being blessed, we should just thank God for it. We shouldn't get our ruffles up and say, well, they cheated or, or I don't like what they did. We need to be thankful that God has blessed them. Most church splits are because of this, this one thing, this variance, this strife. People want their own way no matter how much it hurts the kingdom of God. See, we got to start thinking in the bigger picture. Go into all the world and preach the gospel. No, I'm too busy fighting my brother or sister in the house of the Lord. And that should never be. I'm not a pushover, but I pick and choose which battles I want to get in. And if the battle causes somebody to stumble, or it causes somebody to fall, or it causes some new Christian or to, to get caught up in all that foolishness. I can't tell you how many times I've seen it in my lifetime and seen new Christians fall away and stop serving the Lord because they're like, if that's Christianity, I don't want no part of it. If there's one thing that destroys a church's reputation in the community is when a church is given to arguments. I think that's why a lot of people go to large churches because they, they, they find that uh, they can just blend in the crowd without uh, having to be accountable to anybody, without uh, being noticed. They don't have to talk to anybody other than the, 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 the hey, how you doing, you know. All of us have different opinions about different things. If we all sat down and talked long enough, we could find things we disagree on. But we could also spend more time talking about the things we do agree on. We are supposed to bless each other. We're supposed to provoke each other to good works. We're supposed to encourage one another. When we find ourselves fighting and striving over foolishness, it grieves the heart of God. The early church fought over doctrine. Today, we don't even know what doctrine is. We don't even know what we believe or where it's found in the Bible, let alone argue over it. We're more concerned about arguing over the chandeliers versus the economy lights. We're more concerned with the stripes in the parking lot or concerned with who's running the kitchen or who's in the nursery or who got to sing a special in the church. Galatians 5.13 says, For you, brethren, have been called to liberty. Only do not use liberty as an opportunity for the flesh, but through love serve one another. If you're serving a person, you're not condemning that person. And so you can get out of strife. The next word in that text is emulations or jealousy. Dear Lord, if there's one thing in the church that pops its ugly head, it's this word jealousy. This person's jealous of another one singing the special. This one's jealous because their, their classroom is bigger than the others. The church I grew up in, they built a new wing and it had large classrooms. And uh, 
we had a consultant come in and say to the pastor in the board of that church, you, you really ought to put the children in the larger rooms and let the adults be in the smaller classrooms. Well, some of these adults got all up in arms about it. They're like, I, one man stood up and said, I don't have enough room to cuss a cat out. And I'm thinking, you ain't got to be cussing nobody. And you're a Sunday school teacher. And as a, as a youth, I was just floored by this man that I looked up to, but I didn't look up to him anymore because he was jealous of the children getting the new larger classrooms. The key to not walking in jealousy is to walk in the spirit. Galatians 5, 16 says, I say then walk in the spirit and you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. I want people to prosper. I want them to, to be blessed. If they can out preach me, out sing me, out play me, I don't care. I'm happy for them. I can give up any job I've got. Uh, I can always do it a different way. Because I don't want emulation or jealousy in my life. The next character heated trait there is wrath or anger. You know, a lot of God's people have anger problems. They are abusive to their animals. They're hateful to their husband and wife. You, you just listen. Just put your ears on and listen how a husband talks to his wife and how a wife talks to her husband. How the parents talk to the children and how the children talk to the parents. It'll absolutely curl your hair listening to God's people talking to one another. Anger, fiery, tempered, flashes of hostile feeling, easily provoked, passionate anger, fits of rage, short fuses, saying you have the right to be mad. Well, Flip Wilson used to say, the devil made me do it. He used to say the devil made him do it. But I'm here to tell you the devil doesn't make you lose your temper. You lose your temper on your own. In fact, you don't lose it, you find your temper. Your husband or wife didn't make you lose your temper. I've had, in, in counseling couples, I've had a, a man say, she provoked me. And I'm like, yeah, and you know what you could have done? You could have got up and walked away. You could have went out in the yard and plucked weeds until your anger subsided. Your children didn't make you lose your temper. You lost your temper. And I'm here to tell you, if, you're, if you've got teenagers, they're going to step on your last nerve, and they're going to drive you to the edge of insanity. What you have to do is you have to take a step back and you say, go to your room. I used to do that all the time. I'd say to my uh, kids, go to your room. I need time to pray and think about what we're going to talk about. And then you get along with God and you pray to that child and that love that you had when you first saw that baby that very first day will come back into your heart for that wayward teenager. And you'll go in there and you'll say, you know what, I prayed about it and I feel like you need a spanking. And then you give them one. And you do it in a, a calm, purposeful way. I would say, you're going to get five licks with my hand. And I'd turn them over the bed and I'd give them five licks. Sometimes I'd say, you're going to get three licks. Sometimes I'd say, you're just going to stay in here the rest of the night and think about what you did. And I'll come and talk to you later tonight. Because sometimes I have seen folks get so angry and the thing gets so heated that they about kill the kid and then children and families gets involved and then they get their kid removed from the home. When it could have been avoided, it could have been avoided by just taking a step back. You lost your temper because you have a temper inside of you it's nobody's fault but yours and what you have to do is get to an altar by your bed in the church in the car wherever you pray and you cry out to God and you say God take this from me give me knowledge and wisdom and understanding how to get rid of anger 
and strife out of my life. If you find that you have fits of rage, that means you have a short prayer life. A longer prayer life tends to have longer patience. Maybe you have a disorder. I know some folks that have a demon. It's a demon of anger. And it needs to be cast out in Jesus' name. Maybe you've developed a habit. Maybe you watched your parents scream and argue and yell. And so now you wind up yelling and screaming and carrying on. And if you develop that habit, you can turn it around and develop a new habit of peace and tranquility. And you can stop being angry. And when you feel the first signs of being angry, you can go to prayer. I had to teach myself years ago. I was sitting in the church and the Holy Ghost revealed to me that I had an anger issue. And I prayed before God and I wept before God and I, I cried out and said, God, take this away from me. And the Holy Ghost said, you know what you feel? I get that tightness in my throat, my hands want to do this, you know. I get tight in my body. That's the first sign that I'm getting upset. My eyes get wider and I get like a bull in a china shop. So I've, I've discerned when I start to feel that way and that's when I go pluck weeds. That's why I don't have very many weeds in the yard. I go pluck, instead of plucking Leisha's head off or the girl's head off, I go pluck weeds head off. God's people have no business with a short fuse. And if you do, you need to get rid of it in Jesus' name. All four of these heated emotions are able to be controlled by the power of the Holy Ghost. God did not give you these emotions. The devil intensifies and tempts you and torments you to act out what is natural for the sin nature but God wants you to get victory over your sin nature and he wants you to have the peace of God that passes all understanding to fill your heart and mind so let me ask you as I close this message this morning do you have hatred in your heart do you have variance or strife do you have emulations jealousies and envies and rivalries are you full of wrath, that short fuse? Well, God can set you free. Let's pray. Father, in the name of Jesus, I pray for every person that's struggling with hatred, that you will baptize them afresh in love and mercy and kindness and grace. Help them to remember that you forgave them for all of their sins so they have to turn around and forgive the other person their sins. Teach us how to love and to put others ahead of ourselves. Lord, help us to stay away from strife and to avoid it like a plague in the name of Jesus. Lord, let us not have any jealousy, no rivalry in our hearts. And then, Lord, remove that short fuse in Jesus' name. And I thank you for it. I thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, if you need help anytime with this, any of these areas, I'm not going to tell anybody your business. I keep confidence. Please let me help you. I, that's what I'm here for. I'm here to help you work through these emotions, these heated emotions. We love you and hope you have a blessed rest of your week and happy Father's Day. If you have your tithes and offerings and you're not able to come into the house of the Lord, then mail them to 816 Columbus Street, Waycross, Georgia, 31503. Thank you for watching this today and you be blessed in Jesus' name.